Okay, thank you. Well, that, that is a first. I've given a lot of talks at various places, but never been introduced twice. Uh, so thank you both, Joan and Steve. Um, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me here, and thanks belatedly for the organization's book prize from last year, which unfortunately I was in England um, and unable to come and accept. Uh, Michael Burlingame turned down my proposal that I fly over first class from London <laughs> in order to attend the meeting. Um, so um, I'm going to talk for a while about you know, some themes that uh, arise in my recent book about Lincoln, and then uh, I'd be happy to spend a little time answering questions. They have a little 15 minutes or something slot uh, marked out for that. But first, let me just remind you, I don't need to tell everybody in this room that Lincoln is uh, sort of the most iconic figure in American history, um, and the, the gigantic number of works on Lincoln, which keep coming out, there never is a last word about Lincoln. Um, and uh, even as we speak, uh, you know, um, movies are in the works about Lincoln. Um, Steven Spielberg is doing a biographical uh, film about Lincoln, and there's one coming out that based on a bestseller that will hit two uh, important audiences. You know, Lincoln the Vampire Hunter will be soon. <laughs> um, and, um, but just to show you what happens when you get involved in the sort of Lincoln world, um, this is an email I got recently. Uh, it's uh, actually, this is true. Here it is. Here's my email from saying, uh, here's what they wanted. Dear Professor Foner, our movie Saving Lincoln centers on the relationship between Lincoln and Ward Hill Lamon during the White House years. So many of you know Lamon was a kind of a crony of Lincoln's out in Illinois and came, came to Washington with Lincoln and became marshal of the District of Columbia. All right, what's the problem? What's the question? Lamon plays the banjo in several scenes. Did Lincoln play any musical instrument, specifically the harmonica? We'd love to show the two old friends jamming with Lamon... <laughs> Lamon on banjo and Lincoln on harmonica. Does this sound plausible to you? <laughs> now, Michael Burlingame has done more research. I, I have never seen any evidence about Lincoln playing the harmonica. I don't know if you have. But I figured, all right, I wrote back to him. I said, go for it, go for it. Well, go ahead, do it. <laughs> I said, I'm sure this will be just as accurate as the rest of your movie. <laughs> um, so um, the, my book on Lincoln is not a, a biography. Michael Burlingame has produced a very long, important, detailed biography. There are many other one-volume biographies. Um, I felt at some point that even though there's so much work, that there was still room for a book that kind of shined a kind of very bright, concentrated light on Lincoln's relationship to slavery, his, his experiences with slavery, his... Um, his ideas about slavery and, of course, the joined issue of race uh, and how they evolved, and his policies, of course, about slavery and how they evolved over the course of his life. As I say, it's not a biography. I don't deal with his personal life very much. It's not a military history of the Civil War. And um, I came to, in, in a sentence, which is a bit oversimplified, I came to believe that the kind of hallmark of Lincoln's greatness was what I call his capacity for growth, that by the, at the end of his life, he occupied very different positions with, in relation to these questions of race and slavery than he had at various points earlier in his career. That, may not, that seems like a fairly obvious point. But I think uh, much of the Lincoln literature, no one in this room, but much of the Lincoln literature suffers uh, from a, a kind of tendency to try to freeze Lincoln, that to take one quotation, one speech, one moment, and say, this is the quintessential Lincoln. Um, and, um, you know, depending on which Lincoln you want to have, the canny politician, the, the moralist, the emancipator of the slaves, the racist, you can find a quote that will be Lincoln. But as I say, I think that's a kind of pointless uh, exercise because of this, this uh, changing quality of his uh, ideas and, and outlook. Um, I was particularly interested in Lincoln's complicated relationship with... Um, abolitionists and radical Republicans. The, you know, Lincoln is part of a broad spectrum of anti-slavery thought, which ranges on one end from you know, radical abolitionists who demanded the immediate 
abolition of slavery and incorporating African Americans as equal members of American society. That's the abolitionist stance. At the other end, there were people who were really quite racist but opposed the westward expansion of slavery for one reason or another. Uh, there were many who believed that black people who once free should leave the United States. Where, this is the notion they call colonization, whether voluntarily or uh, compulsorily. Um, and there were those who, you know, thought about compensating owners. Lincoln, my point is Lincoln occupied different positions on this spectrum at different uh, points in his life. But, um, and many scholars, I think, wrongly see Lincoln and the radical and abolitionist as kind of, uh, uh, you know, opposite, opposite approaches to politics. That um, Lincoln is the pragmatist, Lincoln is the model of mature and uh, statesmanship, and unfortunately, when in that kind of judgment, which uh, actually, to go back to Steve, it's mostly political scientists who write that, actually, not historians, because they don't really know much about history. But um, <laughs> the, uh, the, then the abolitionists are portrayed just as irresponsible fanatics. You know, uh, they're just kind of nuts, or, and, and, and they make all these irresponsible statements, and they help to bring on the Civil War. To me, the relationship is much more symbiotic than... Um, than Conflictual. Now, the abolitionists frequently criticized Lincoln strongly. Lincoln often said some unkind things about them. But uh, Lincoln understood that he and they were sort of in the same boat. Or perhaps a better analogy is they were going on the same path at different speeds. Lincoln sees himself as part of a broad anti-slavery world of which the abolitionists are also a part. He understood, as a very, very shrewd politician, as you all know, Lincoln understands the importance of public sentiment, public opinion in a political democracy, and he appreciates that these abolitionists working outside of politics are helping to create an anti-slavery public sentiment that makes his kind of politics possible. In other words, you can't have Lincoln without more radical people who are stirring up the issue and making it part of the political, uh, political agenda. Um, and of course, you know, Lincoln, as everybody knows, was a politician. That was his love. And, uh, you know, he made a living as a lawyer, but politics was really his passion. He first ran for office around the age of 21 or 22. And from then on, he was either in office or running for office or involved in politics almost every year of his life. Um, but in the first part of his career, up to the 1850s, slavery played a, a minor role. Lincoln, Lincoln said once, I, you know, I've always, I can't remember when I didn't hate slavery, and I don't think there's any reason to doubt that, but he didn't see slavery as a viable political issue. He made a few statements here and there, but he largely thought of slavery as a disruptive issue, particularly for the Whig Party. Lincoln was a very devout Whig. This was unfortunate because the Whigs always lost in Illinois, and that was a problem for Lincoln. He represented one little district where the Whigs were a majority, but they never elected a governor. They never elected a senator. They were always in the minority. And, uh, but Lincoln clung to the Whig party, and he helped. But what, what, it, what appealed to him about the Whigs was their economic policies, their belief in what we would call today sort of economic stimulus, you know, and uh, uh, infrastructure development, uh, building roads and railroads and canals and uh, tariffs to protect industry and schools and creating the, you know, the government should intervene to create the economic conditions for people like Lincoln to, you know, improve their condition of life in a market society. Um, but the Whigs are a national party. There's a lot of Southern Whigs. Lincoln knows them. He hangs around with them in Congress. And the slavery issue, he understands, will just disrupt the Whig party. And therefore, it really should not be uh, uh, emphasized at all in politics. It's only in the 1850s, of course, when the Whig party collapses, when the issue of the westward expansion of slavery becomes the dominant issue in national politics, that Lincoln emerges as the most important spokesman in Illinois for the new Republican Party, which arises as a northern party, not a national party, a northern sectional party devoted to stopping the westward expansion of slavery. And Lincoln, um, Lincoln emerges as the most eloquent, the most powerful uh, spokesman in Illinois for this position of stopping the westward expansion of slavery. And yet if you read his speeches in the 1850s, 
you know, constitutionally speaking, that's all you can do. There is no way the federal government can actually intervene to affect the uh, abolition of slavery in the South. The only constitutionally permissible position is stopping slavery from moving westward. But Lincoln is always talking about slavery in the abstract, not just the question of the territories. He uses language which is abolitionist language. He talks about slavery as a monstrous injustice. He talks about slavery as a cancer that is eating away the lifeblood of the American nation. It's not just non-extension. He, he borrows, actually, from his great political um, uh, idol, Henry Clay, a very good political phrase, the ultimate extinction of slavery. He says, we are... We're fighting about the territories, but let's always bear in mind the real issue here is the ultimate extinction of putting the country on the road to the ultimate extinction of slavery. Now, the ultimate, oh, that's a phrase whose meaning um, really varies depending on which word you want to emphasize, right? If you emphasize ultimate, it's a long time. At one point, Lincoln says, you know, slavery may last another hundred years. That would mean in 1950, there'd still be slavery. That's very ultimate. On the other hand, what the South heard was the word extinction. Here's a guy who is committed to a future, who knows quite when, without slavery. And they didn't much care whether Lincoln was talking about getting rid of slavery now or 10 years or 20 years. He was a guy who was committed to, as he kept saying, putting the nation on the road to getting rid of sla- to a future without slavery. Um, So uh, that is why it was not the election of John Brown, you know, or William Lloyd Garrison that led to the secession of the South. It was the election of a mainstream Republican politician from Illinois, Lincoln, because the, the white South did not feel slavery was, the future of slavery was safe under the government of someone publicly committed to helping to get rid of slavery in the future. Um... But, um, of course, Lincoln was not an abolitionist, and I think it is, you know, there are some books which argue that Lincoln was sort of born with a pen in his hand, ready to sign the Emancipation Proclamation, and he kept it secret uh, for many years because he had to wait for people to catch up with him. No, that is not the case either. Lincoln never claimed to be an abolitionist. He wasn't. Why not? If he, he once said, I hate slavery as much as any abolitionist. But, well, you could say on political grounds... You couldn't be an abolitionist in Illinois if you wanted political success. There were hardly any in Illinois, and certainly in central Illinois, where Lincoln lived, there were virtually no abolitionists. But I don't think the point is that Lincoln was a secret abolitionist, couldn't say so for political reasons. Their whole frame of mind was different in important ways. First of all, Lincoln, uh, you know, William Lloyd Garrison burned the Constitution. He said it was a covenant with the devil because of its um, clauses protecting the institution of slavery. Lincoln revered the Constitution and, um, and believed, uh, more to the point perhaps, Lincoln believed, as many people did then and do now, that the United States had this sort of mission to exemplify and promote the principle of democracy in the world. You know, th- this is what the Gettysburg Address is about, right? That... The, the, that the war is whether democracy or what he calls government of the people, by the people, for the people will survive in the world or not. The United States is the symbol of democracy in a world overrun with tyranny. And um, slavery has a very complicated relationship to that. On the one hand, slavery undermines that mission. It, as he says, it makes the United States look like hypocrites. We talk about liberty, we talk about democracy, and yet we hold millions of people in slavery. On the other hand... Because of this mission, the nation must be preserved, the union must be preserved, and the compromises of the Constitution, which include some very distasteful things, must be uh, respected. You know, he says about fugitive slaves, I hate to see them hunted down, but I bite my lip and keep silent. Why does he keep silent? He keeps silent because that's in the Constitution. The right of the South to get their fugitive slaves back is irrefutably in the Constitution, and to violate that will set off a spiral which may break up the whole union, because if you can violate that part of the Constitution, you can violate other parts, and constitutional government will, will uh, disintegrate. Now, of course, abolitionists and many others in the North 
didn't bite their lips. They helped fugitive slaves, or they, they said, I have no moral, you know, there's a higher law, there's a moral law, which tells me I must aid the fugitive who is running away from slavery. Um, even fairly moderate people, when confronted with that, helped the fugitive. They didn't want to abide by the law and send him back into slavery. But Lincoln, so, so Lincoln is willing to make those compromises, and that's one of the key differences between an abolitionist. But another difference, of course, is this question of race, this very much looked at and uh, much misunderstood, I think, question of Lincoln and race. The abolitionists, as I said, demanded that they were the first progenitors of the idea of America that we pretty much take for granted today. That is to say that this is a country of people of all kinds of origins, all kinds of backgrounds, races, who uh, ought to be treated equally before the law and who share some kind of, whatever their difference is, a kind of commitment to the principles of the nation. Um, there is no racial or ethnic definition of who is an American. Now, there are some people who may not accept that fully, but that was not the case in the 19th century. This was a white man society. The Supreme Court said in the Dred Scott decision that only white people could be citizens of the United States, no black person. Um, Lincoln criticized that, of course, but it was the abolitionists who put forward this alternative vision of a society beyond race, a society of equal rights for all beyond race. Um, now, Lincoln didn't really hold that view, certainly in the, in the, 19, in the 1850s. Um, I think it's what the, fair to say that Lincoln shared some of the prejudices of his society, no question about it. This, Illinois is one of the most deeply racist states in the nation. The laws discriminating against black people in Illinois, the so-called black laws, are about as severe as in any state outside of the South. Um, Lincoln never criticized the black laws of Illinois. But what's interesting, I think, is ha in, in working on this book, what surprised me was how little Lincoln says about race. You know, this is what my old professor John Garrity uh, referred to as the fallacy of the note cards. You can pull to get, you can get all these note cards together. Do they feel, still use note cards now? I don't know, you know, but uh, I do. Um, you can put all your note cards together. You can take all these quotes about race, stick them together, and you've got a great trend. But in fact, it's your own construction that, in fact, you're pulling things from all over the place. There is no real trend in history. It's just you've created it. Lincoln said virtually nothing about race. The only time he really talked about race was in 1858 during the senatorial campaign where he's running for the Senate. Stephen A. Douglas keeps hammering him with this notion of Negro equality. Lincoln is in favor of Negro equality. Um, at first, Lincoln says... What the heck is he talking about? That's immaterial. I'm talking about slavery. Negro equality has nothing to do with this. Back then, as you know, the, uh, the senator was elected by the members of the legislature, not by popular vote. So guys running for the legislature on the Republican ticket start running, writing to Lincoln. Hey, look here, Lincoln, you know, you better say something in response to this. It's injuring my campaign that Douglas is attacking you as a believer in Negro equality. And so eventually in the, you know, one of the debates, the Charleston debate, Lincoln gets up and says, the often quote, about, well, no, I don't believe in Negro equality. I don't believe they should have the right to vote. I don't believe they should have the right to hold office. I don't believe they should, uh, you know, intermarry with white people. He does insist, I do believe that all people, black and white, are entitled to the basic natural rights enunciated in the Declaration, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Um, Douglas insists that only applies to white people, that the founders didn't mean blacks when they said all men are created equal and all this. But, um, so Lincoln repudiates Negro equality. But as I say, that's basically... The, race doesn't normally play any role in Lincoln's discussions of slavery. And in fact, in the 1850s, when Lincoln does talk about race at all, it, it's fairly apparent that he sees African Americans as a kind of an alien people who have been unjustly and unnaturally uprooted from their homeland, subjected to a terrible injustice in the United States. They should become free, but from Henry Clay and from Thomas Jefferson, he adopts this idea of colonization. They should leave the country voluntarily, but with some assistance, and um, find their, uh, enjoy their natural rights somewhere else in Africa, in Central America. 
Lincoln is actually a mem an official of the Illinois Colonization Society in 1858. So it's not, it's not just a minor issue. But what I find interesting in that, and you know, and this is, I think, most black people completely rejected that idea. Um, what I find interesting is, as I say, he took these from Clay and Jefferson. Why should black people leave the United States? Henry Clay, an anti-slavery slave owner, says they should leave because they're a dangerous, violent, criminal element. They can't live here as free people. It would be disruptive to society. So even though slavery is wrong, they should be freed and get them out of the country because they're a danger to white people. Lincoln never says anything remotely like that. Jefferson, a tortured soul who mulls all this stuff over, um, also says, yes, they should become free, but they must be shipped out of the country. Jefferson devises all these totally crazy schemes for how to get rid of all the black people from America. Why? Jefferson is obsessed with the danger of, quote, amalgamation. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Jefferson practices amalgamation, but he is completely... <laughs> Completely, uh, he thinks that it will destroy American society, etc. So if you two freed people, you're going to get them out. So there's no Lincoln doesn't care about that either. Why should they leave the country? Lincoln says because racism is so powerful in America that they will never be able to enjoy equality in this country. They will never be able to enjoy their equal rights. They should enjoy rights, but somewhere else. But you see the. The thing about the, the appeal of this colonization idea is it enables you to talk about the end of slavery without considering the question of race in a post-slavery society. Because if you're asked, well, what's going to happen to these people? The answer is, well, they're going to leave, and therefore I don't have to worry about are they going to have this right, that right, vote. No, they're not going to be here. So it, it, it's a way, and Frederick Douglass says this, it's a way of soothing a troubled conscience in a way that you can talk about slavery and ignore the question of race. Well, you know, it, it, one could go on and on about this, but I want to talk a little about Lincoln as president and what happens to those ideas that he brings into uh, the Civil War. Um, I'm not going to give you the whole chronology of emancipation. We, you know, that's been explained in many places. But, you know, in the first two years of the war, or the first year and a half, let's say, Lincoln basically keeps proposing variations on his pre-war ideas. Um, some people think Lincoln is really slow moving toward uh, ending slavery. I don't think that's true at all. In the fall of 1861, there hasn't even been a battle. There would have been Bill, Bull Run, but that's nothing compared to what comes later. Um, Lincoln calls in the congressman from Delaware. Later he extends this to the other border states, the slave states in the Union, and he says, you know, we've got to get this emancipation going. Delaware. Delaware's not far from here, right? Delaware. There's only 1,800 slaves. It's not a big deal in Delaware. Delaware can be the place that launches emancipation in America. Um, Delaware will have the honor, you know. And here's the plan, he says. I got a plan. My plan is, it's the same plan from before the war. Gradual emancipation. It'll take place over a long period of time. Compensation. We will pay the owners. The federal government will pay the owners because after all, slaves are property. They're going to be reimbursed. And colonization colonization. They will be sent out of the country. And he promotes this throughout late 1861, early, mid-1862. He promotes it to the border congressmen. He promotes it to a group of black leaders he brings into the White House in 18, uh, August 1862. The problem is nobody wants this. The slave owners don't want it. Delaware says, forget it, Lincoln. We're not interested in your plan. You don't understand, Lincoln. We want our slaves. We do not want your money. We are slave owners. That's what we are. Slave owners don't give up their slaves for money because slavery is a way of life. It is not just an investment. This should lead people who think that slavery might have died out peacefully without the Civil War to pause. If Delaware, with 1,800 slaves, will not voluntarily give up their slaves for compensation, what's the likelihood of Mississippi doing it? and Alabama and South Carolina, where slavery is the core of the society, not a peripheral institution like in Delaware. Black people also say to Lincoln, I'm sorry, we're not leaving. We are Americans. We have the same right to be here that you do. We're not going anywhere. So Lincoln's plan is kind of not going anywhere. 
Meanwhile, Congress is pushing ahead, as we heard, you know, emancipation in D.C., um, other measures, uh, which Lincoln signs, of course. He, 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 he approves of these measures that go through Congress. But eventually, of course, uh, and this is making a giant story short, he realizes a completely different approach to slavery is necessary, and that leads him to the preliminary and then the final Emancipation Proclamation. Now, we heard a minute ago that the Emancipation Proclamation will be on display uh, in Washington and, uh, you know, on its 150th anniversary. One of the things that really st struck me in studying Lincoln, and, you know, I've written a lot about the 19th century. Lincoln pops up in my previous books. But the, you know, and many of you realize that the brilliance of Lincoln's language, command of language, writing, means that you have to read very carefully, really carefully. There are things that you don't notice if you read Lincoln quickly that are in there and are, you know, he's very, he's a great craftsman of language. So the words are in there for a reason. Um, if you read the Emancipation Proclamation, I mean, how many times have I read it? But I read it again and I saw things I had never seen before. For example, he says he addresses black people directly in the, it's a military order, but part of it is a direct address to black people, saying, first of all, people say, oh, you know, you free the slaves, they're going to run amok, they're going to massacre everybody. Um, he says, I urge upon you, you know, to be peaceful. Well, he could have stopped right there, but he says, no, except in necessary self-defense. They have a right to defend the freedom that has just been accorded them. He didn't have to say that, but he's telling them, you are actors now on the historical stage. You are not just slaves. Or when he says to them, and the proclamation drops the idea of colonization, there's nothing in there about it. He says, I urge you to go to work here in the United States for reasonable wages. Now, why do you put that word reasonable in there? Isn't that interesting? Re not just wages, not just go to work for wages, go to work for reasonable wages. They have a right to decide whether the wages being offered them are reasonable or not. And if it's not, they can demand higher wages. But again, it's making them people, dealing with them as people with volition, with ambition. They're part of the, you know, fabric of the society they're going to be. And of course, the proclamation for the first time opens the, uh, officially opens the army to black enlistment. And by the end of the war, something like 200,000 black men have served in the Union Army and Navy. And again, to make a long story short, um, I really believe that uh, in the last two years of his life, Lincoln really for the first time begins thinking seriously about the role African Americans will play in a post-war world. Once you drop this idea of colonization, then you've got to face up to the question of race. It had enabled you to avoid that, but now there it is. What is going to be the status of these four million people when the war is over? Now, of course, all this requires the Union to win the war. There's no question in my mind that if the Confederacy had won, which was eminently possible, slavery would have continued for a long, long time. In this, in, well, it would have been a different country, but slavery would have continued there. But the proclamation announces, and this is its significance, it's not how many people were freed on the day of January 1st, it's that henceforth protecting the freedom of these slaves, and it's not all the slaves, it's about three quarters of them or so, um, that is one of the tasks of the Union Army. It is one of the tasks of the war. The war is now a war for Union and emancipation, something Lincoln will not retreat from. Um, but that means you've got to think about, and I think, you know, the future of African Americans, and I think that the service of black soldiers is really critical in Lincoln's evolving ideas about race. Lincoln comes to feel that by fighting and dying for the nation, they have staked a claim to citizenship in the post-war world. And at the very end of his life, of course, in what we call his last speech, he says this explicitly publicly for the first time, that he would prefer that the, some blacks, including the soldiers, be given the right to vote in the reconstructed South, particularly Louisiana, uh, what he's talking about there. But, you know, that seems to some people, well, that's kind of half-baked, only some blacks. You know, Lincoln is saying this in April 1865 at a time when only five northern states allowed any black people to vote. Illinois didn't allow any black people to vote. Pennsylvania, Ohio did not allow any black people to vote. By this point, Lincoln is ahead of the curve when it comes to... Um, 
you know, what the rights of at least some black people are going to be in the post-war world. But more than that, and I will uh, uh, finish with this, I think, I think Lincoln's own racial views evolve in the last two years of the war. Another surprise, you know, as I say, when you're doing research, you always find unusual things. Another thing that surprised me was how many African Americans Lincoln actually met with in the White House during the war. Lincoln is the first president to actually sit down and talk to African Americans as members of American society. There had been slaves, plenty of them, working in the White House before the Civil War. But, you know, and everybody knows Lincoln met a couple of times with Frederick Douglass. But as I just kept track of this, I was amazed how many other, Martin Delaney goes through, Sojourner Truth, Alexander Crummel, Bishop Payne of the AME Church, delegations of black churchmen, delegation from New Orleans. Lincoln didn't have any, you know, he may have, as I said, shared these prejudices, but he had no visceral dislike of black people. He had no problem sitting down and chatting with them about uh, politics or whatever was on their mind. He didn't, didn't, didn't recoil from that or anything like that. Um, and, um, and I think that contact with people like that really helps to change Lincoln's you know, inherited racial views. He didn't know any black people in Illinois. For, there were no black people in Illinois. In 1860, the population of Illinois was 1.8 million and there were like 12,000 African Americans. You could live your entire life as a white person in Illinois and never see a black person. Now, there were some blacks in Illinois, and you know, we know Lincoln befriended his barber. There were a couple of women who worked in his house, but that's not the kind of relationship I'm talking about. He had never met pol educated, articulate, politically active black people. That's why it's important that he wasn't an abolitionist, not because of his views, but the abolitionist movement was where black and white people came together and worked for a common cause. It was the only interracial political movement in the country. Lincoln didn't have that experience. In the war, he begins to get contact and with, with these, you know, ac people like himself, intelligent, articulate people, and I think that broadens his views about race uh, considerably. And, of course, meeting with Frederick Douglass, you know, I think he saw Douglass as a kind of kindred spirit in a way. They're both self-made men in the rhetoric of the of the 19th century, and uh, people who had, from nowhere, from absolute, the most, you know, the most humble backgrounds, Douglas even further down the social scale than Lincoln, uh, had educated themselves and become master writers and orators and thinkers, and I think that really, you know, helps to change Lincoln's mind. So, um, so just to finish, and as I say, I'd like to leave a little time for some questions. I think that the, the way, to me, the way to understand Lincoln is not to posit him as someone who was perfect his whole life or the opposite, he was horrible his whole life. You know, whenever you put someone up on a pedestal, someone is always going to come along with a sledgehammer and knock him down. Um, but as someone who had this capacity to change, to listen to criticism, to learn, um, to, you know, to have the sense that he didn't have all the answers and that when he tried, when Lincoln combines to me a, you know, a strong moral sense against slavery all through his life, but with a, you know, a, a complete range of possible ways of doing that. And I think as he goes along, and by the end of his life, he has moved far down the road. Lincoln was not, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. a hundred years earlier, but he was. Um, I think he was a man who had this capacity to grow and change, and his views at the end of his life were far more broad and inclusive than they had been uh, earlier on. And to me, that's really the story both of Lincoln's greatness and of what happens to American society in a way in the great you know, crisis of the Civil War. So let me stop there. I've tried to end at the time I was supposed to so that uh, we can have a few questions, but thanks very much for listening. I guess, um, I guess for questions, there are these two microphones. So, yes, sir. Uh, I really enjoy your book, uh, and I have a question about D.C. emancipation. We're just about entering the 150th anniversary of the debate, particularly the Senate debate. And in the Senate, there was a tie vote, 27-27, uh, on an amendment that would have required compulsory colonization or deportation of the freed slaves in D.C. Hannibal Hamlin breaks that tie uh, against that amendment 
and some more innocuous language about appropriations mm -hmm. for voluntary colonization goes in. Uh, I've been looking for any evidence that Lincoln uh, took any role in that debate, and particularly whether he ever supported forcible or compulsory uh, deportation, right. and particularly whether he might have influenced uh, Hannibal Hamlin's vote to uh, uh, get that bill back on track. That's an interesting question. Lincoln always said that deportation, or no, should say colonization, should be voluntary. There were people in his cabinet, like Attorney General Bates, who said, no, it should be compulsory. We should just get rid of these people. Lincoln always said it should be voluntary, which was a serious problem for the plan, since the vast majority of black people did not want to go. Um, I have not, you know, Lincoln and Congress is itself a very long, complicated, <laughs> interesting story. Uh, uh, for one thing, Lincoln was a Whig originally, and the Whigs tended to because they were formed in opposition to Andrew Jackson, they tended to think Congress should have much more power and the president should kind of lie low. Now, Lincoln, of course, takes some very dramatic actions as president and as commander-in-chief, he oversees the military and he keeps control of the slavery issue as much as he can, but by and large, he doesn't intervene in congressional uh, uh, proceedings. You know, people in Congress find out what Lincoln thinks, no question about it. But Lincoln is not like oh, Lyndon Johnson, you know, kind of glad-handing people. Uh, the, probably his biggest intervention in congressional proceedings was when he helped to orchestrate the twisting of arms to get the 13th Amendment ratified in the House in uh, January 1865. I don't, you know, I think that vote shows you that colonization was part of the discussion in 1862, and there were a lot of people, Republican uh, uh, as well, who thought it was a good idea. But I think compulsory, I, Hamlin is a completely unknown character. Nobody knows anything much about Hamlin. He did nothing as vice president, you know? I mean, when, when Lincoln issues the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, Hamlin writes him a note saying, oh, that's a great idea, Lincoln. In other words, he never, never even mentioned it to Hamlin, his vice president, that he was planning to do this. Hamlin's kind of surprised, you know? Um, so I think that was just Hamlin's own uh, personal point of view. But I don't think compulsory uh, deportation could ever have actually passed Congress. Uh, there were enough Republicans who were opposed to it. And they did make an appropriation. Washington, D.C. emancipation is the only one that includes both compensation. The owners got a little bit of money, not much, but some, and, uh, and colonization. The only problem was... The American Colonization Society said, this is great, and they came to Washington, and they tried to start up, and they lamented. They only found one guy who was willing to leave. <laughs> there was $100,000 or so uh, appropriated. Only one black person in Washington was willing to leave. So uh, it was a good sign of the fact that this colonization plan was not really going to be uh, uh, effectively implemented. Yes? Dr. Foner, um, at the time Lincoln was coming up, Slavery was a protected institution, whereas the African slave trade was not. Right. There had been at least five or six congressional acts prohibiting it. Do you right. draw a distinction between Lincoln's perception and his evolving perception of slavery versus the slave trade? Well, yes. The slave trade, of course, was abolished. The first law, right in 1808, when the, after the 20-year high, you know, the Constitution said you couldn't abolish the slave trade for 20 years. As soon as that 20 years happened, it was abolished, although it continued. I mean, it was abolished in the law, but it was not enforced. Most presidential administrations up to Lincoln did not really enforce that. And it's not the slave trade so much into the U.S., but American ships in violation of the law picking up slaves in Africa and bringing them into the West Indies, to Cuba, et cetera, et cetera. That continued. Um, you know, it's interesting. One of the less well-known uh, remarks of Lincoln in the 1850s was where he, saw, he says, you know, every schoolboy has heard the names of Wilberforce and Sharp. That's probably not true today. Maybe it was then. Wilberforce and Sharp, the leaders of the British crusade to abolish the African slave trade. Uh, but who can name a person who opposed them? In other words, Lincoln, that's, Lincoln sees himself as part of this long-term tendency against slavery, and Wilberforce and Sharp are there. But, um, you know, and of course, fast forward to his presidency, Lincoln approves the only execution of a slave trader in American history, Nathaniel Gordon, who had been prosecuted under Buchanan. There were people prosecuted, but they were always commuted or, you know, let off after it. Lincoln has him executed. He refuses to commute his sentence. And that's a signal, I think, in early 1862. It's a very good way, book on that, by the way. In Brooklyn, yeah, okay. 
<laughs> Good. Well, but you know, the, as you well know, you could be bitterly opposed to the slave trade from Africa and not at all opposed to slavery. Those were, in people's minds, those were two very different things. And indeed, there were, you know, there were many American, you know, Virginia, for example, which part of its economy was selling slaves into the Deep South, was bitterly opposed to any talk of reopening the African slave trade because that would undercut their economy. So they had two different things. Lincoln doesn't say a heck of a lot about the slave trade except to say how come he says it seems illogical that people are so opposed to the African slave trade and then yet they refuse to condemn slavery because really the same moral issue is involved here. All right. Anyway. Thank you. Yes. Um, I know that you said this before that Lincoln revered the Constitution as like a holy scripture, but during 1861 when he issued the executive order to um, discontinue habeas corpus and he arrested 13,000 civilians, do you feel that was necessary and was it justified in your um, view? The suspension of habeas corpus, military arrests, excellent question. I mean, you know, um, Today, there are still those who condemn Lincoln as a tyrant who overran civil liberties and created a kind of Leviathan state that is a danger. You know, the, how shall I put this? James Madison, back in 1794, wrote a brilliant little essay. We should read it nowadays. About that, He said, you know, people think the danger to our liberty is from Congress. That's why the Bill of Rights... Is, a, is restricting the rights of Congress. Congress shall pass no law abridging freedom of speech, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Madison said that's in the future. The real danger to liberty is in the war power of the president. That is the danger. War is the danger to liberty. I mean, look around today. I, I admire President Obama, but frankly, he is claiming powers which I think are an utter violation of the Constitution, and yet it's under the war power. The right to assassinate Americans without trial, indictment, jury, nothing. And my former student, Eric Holder, he took a class of mine years ago, as, as the Attorney General has justified or figured out a way to justify all this. So, yes, there were certainly violations of civil liberties during the Civil War. Lincoln says in his message to Congress, you know, in the first session, the first special session, he says, I, he doesn't say I violated the Constitution, he says I have gone beyond the Constitution, <laughs> an interesting uh, usage. But um, I think, you know, people who have studied this, most of the violations were committed by local military commanders who were completely overzealous. Uh, Lincoln overturned some of them, he didn't overturn others. Um, I think much of what happened in the Civil War in this realm set a bad precedent for future Presidents who could always go back and say, well, Lincoln allowed violations of civil liberties in wartime, so what we're doing is not at all uh, uh, new. But I don't, you know, on the other hand, elections flourish, the press, you know, if you think Lincoln, Lincoln may, they may have suppressed a newspaper here and there, but certainly, I think we'll hear more about this today, the, the, pre the Democratic press flourished and they said a lot of pretty nasty things about Lincoln without being, um, without being repressed. But you know, I think what happened in the Civil War is a warning to us to be vigilant about civil liberties in times of war, and that has popped up as an issue many times in American history. Yeah. If we, if we accept that in 1860 the goal of the Southern white power structure was to preserve slavery, how reasonable a calculation do you think they were making uh, in opting for secession as opposed to staying within the Union. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. You know, in, in two, I remember this well. In 2000, when the millennium and all this happened, you know, uh, there were all these things about the last uh, th a thousand. Anyway, some magazine, some business magazine, I can't remember which it was, published a thing, the 100 worst business decisions in all of history. <laughs> and, what you know, the Edsel was up there. There was some, or what was it, you know, uh, uh, Western Union not taking the uh, the patent for the telephone because they said it'll never replace the telegraph and stuff like that. The worst business decision in history, they said, was the South's secession because, if you want to view it that way, because uh, slavery was by far, the slaves were by far the largest concentration of property in the United States at that time. And, of course, that property, in the end, was totally liquidated, right? It was, it was abolished with no compensation at all, a rather remarkable thing billions of dollars worth of property. And that's 1860 billions, not our billions. Um, so, and there were plenty of Southerners at the time who said this is a big mistake. But of course there were those who said, wait a minute, cotton is king, 
you know, there's nothing they can do about it. The, the South is so large, they'll never be able to conquer the South. Uh, Britain will intervene on our side. Uh, the, the North is pusillanimous. They're just interested in... You know, there are a million reasons you could say for why the, the, it, it seemed like a reasonable thing to do at the time. They knew that the election of Lincoln marked a kind of turning point in American history in which the North was now sort of taking or seizing the political power that would sort of, in a sense, reflect its growing economic power and population power. And they weren't so afraid of what Lincoln was going to do in 1861. Nobody thought Lincoln was going to come in and say, hey, I'm abolishing slavery. That's absurd. But they saw this as a turning point and in American history and that they were going to be a, a, a permanent and shrinking minority and that their long-term prospects were, uh, were bleak in that situation. Um, and so they opted to, you know, they, they opted to try to strike out on their own. Reasonable? I don't know, but it seemed plausible to a lot of people at the time, that's for sure. W what time do you have to stop, Michael, since you're so organized? All right, a few more minutes. So, yeah, there you go. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. I'm a local person, a uh, guy, Frank Cochran, my name. I see me before I'm an amateur, but I have been totally awed by the past six or seven years of the presentation. I always liked Lincoln. I've got uh, two questions. Uh, if you could, thank you for your brilliant presentation here. One of them is uh, Nancy Hanks, we know, gave this iconic start to Abe. When we say Abe or Abraham, it's, it's automatic uh, versus George or Ben Franklin or Jefferson and so on. But uh, how did, besides his mother, what did his father contribute in what way briefly right. to, to this? And also, if I could say, as an Illinois legislator at 21 years, he was also designing river boats or keel boats and that kind of thing. If you could just comment on that juxtaposition. Well, uh, th th these are I interesting questions. Uh, Michael Burlingham knows more about Lincoln's early life than I do, certainly. Um, and indeed, one of our problems as scholars of Lincoln is the paucity of documentation about Lincoln's early life, actually. Uh, much of it is based on recollections of people, which may or may not be totally accurate. All recollections sometimes get a little hazy or something. But, um, you know, I think uh, how uh, uh, the, one of my two introducers here was a psychiatrist, and he probably has greater insight than I do into how you really plumb the depths of the human psyche and human character. You know, Lincoln, you know, one can explain Lincoln uh, as David Donald, for example, tried to do, purely through outside events. A guy buffeted by events from one thing to another and pressured this way, pressured that way. One can make a plausible case that way. But there's also something inside that is kind of hard to quite figure out where it comes from, but there it is. I mean, it's not just the crisis. You know, the crisis created Lincoln's greatness. I don't, I don't deny, you know, think that's false. Lincoln rose to the occasion that he was presented with, you know, and not everybody can. His successor sank beneath the occasion. You know, Andrew Johnson could not rise to the great crisis that he was confronted with. So obviously the personality and character of the person uh, uh, matters. Um, where that comes from, who knows? I think Lincoln's mother did, I mean, stepmother, uh, had an uh, enormous effect on him because Lincoln somehow figured out really early that the way to get ahead was through his mind. You know, he's a strong guy. He could go out there and work. But on the frontier, that, you know, that was not going to get you very far, physical labor. You know, I mean, you could certainly survive. But if you were very ambitious as Lincoln, well, Lincoln figured out it was through self-education. It was through reading. It was through improve, improving your mind was the way to really get ahead. And um, his stepmother encouraged this, you know, whereas his father seemed to think he was kind of lazy for sitting around reading all the time, you know, out in the backwoods. Um, Lincoln's relation with his father is a fraught one. Personally, I think people are maybe a little too harsh on uh, Lincoln's father. I mean, the guy had a tough life. He worked hard. He tried to support his family. But he lacked ambition, Lincoln felt. Lincoln didn't want to be like his father. His father was a subsistence farmer who just did enough to survive. And, you know, Lincoln wanted to get ahead. And I think he saw his father as an example of what he was trying to get beyond. 
you know, and not become like his father. Now, you know, uh, Oedipus, you know, this goes back a long way, right? The notion of people who hate their fathers. So it's not exactly uh, a new idea. Uh, where that comes from, I don't know. But I think, you know, his father was a model to him of what he didn't want to become. Um, so, but that's, you know, I, I think we historians should be cautious about practicing, psych- practicing psychology without a license because we're not trained to do it. Yes. yes. Thanks very much. It's a terrific talk. Uh, As I remember, Lincoln, in his annual message to Congress in December 1862, is promoting colonization. Absolutely. And I think even afterwards he refers to it. And so uh, he eventually gives it up, certainly by early 65. So my question is, how does he reconcile the Emancipation Proclamation with his still desire to to have colonization? Well, that's a great question. First of all, Lincoln never publicly discusses colonization again after the Emancipation Proclamation. You're right. The December message, one month basically, or slightly less than one month before he issues the proclamation, is slightly bizarre when you know the proclamation is coming because most of it is devoted to a different plan of emancipation altogether. He proposes these constitutional amendments, uh, which include compensation, colonization, gradual emancipation, And people say, well, wait a minute. He said in September he's going to free all the slaves on January 1st. What the heck is all this, you know? He never even mentions the Emancipation Proclamation specifically. Indirectly, he does. So, um, and he, but, and again, his discussion of colonization is bizarre because he says, I want to make it clear I'm in favor of colonization. But then the rest of it is about how people shouldn't be afraid if black people stay in the country. There are not that many of them. They're only one-seventh of the population. They're not going to come up to the north and take people's jobs. So what's the big problem here if slaves become free and people shouldn't be so petrified? So it's a kind of weird discussion. But here is the point. And, in fact, a book was published um, last year about supposedly Lincoln's continued interest in colonization all the way to 1864. But I think that here's the key. Colonization was part of a plan to get rid of slavery. It was a plan premised on the consent of slave owners. There was no way to get rid of slavery without the consent of slave owners under, with, within a legal framework. This was legal property. You need to get state action. It's a creature of state law, and you have, the states must abolish it, as indeed the northern states had done, um, slowly, after the American Revolution. Once you say, we're not interested in their consent anymore, The Emancipation Proclamation does not require the consent of owners or the South. It is a military order. Then you don't need colonization anymore because you're not trying to persuade anybody in the South to accept emancipation. After that, Lincoln does, basically he says, yeah, if people want to leave the country, fine, let them go. You know, I'm happy to help them do that. But it's not part of a plan of emancipation anymore. It's now individuals making a decision about whether they want to live here or there. So, it's, so that is the difference. He still says, yes, if, people, if black people feel their conditions in this country are terrible, they should have the opportunity to move somewhere else. But that's a different question than saying, as part of the end of slavery, we're going to get people out of the country. So I think that is the shift the Emancipation Proclamation uh, represents. Okay. All right, I think we're out of time, so thank you all very much, and let's look forward to the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs>